Good morning, and thank you for joining the archive, Dr. Brian Regal. How are you doing today? Good, good. I'm doing good. Uh, thanks for having me on. So my my latest book is called uh, "The Battle Over America's Origin Story," and it was supposed to be called "Waiting for Columbus." And "Battle Over America's Origin Story" was supposed to be the subtitle, uh, but the publishers, Palgrave Macmillan decided they liked the 300 pages of writing I did, which made up the main part of the text. And, and so I titled the introduction, Waiting for Columbus. And I call it that, or wanted to call it that, because this is a book not about who really discovered America. Uh, we know who discovered America, and it, it wasn't Columbus. Uh, the, you can't, the, the line I always use is, you can't say you discovered a place if when you show up, there's already people there watching you show up. So you can't be the one to discover. You can't be the first one there if there are other people there ahead of you. Uh, and so the only, in the long list of people who come to what we call the Americas, the only ones who, when they showed up, there was no one here in front of them. Uh, were the ancestors to the Native Americans. So, so they discovered America. Uh, we don't have any specific names of individuals, but it's the it's the ancestors of the Native Americans. They discovered America. They were the first ones here. They were the first ones before anybody else. Um, and so what I wanted to do with this book was to write about all these myths and legends about who really, you know, with, with, with the word really in, in quotation marks, who really discovered America. Now, if you ask the average person on the street who discovered America, they'll say Christopher Columbus, of course. 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, yada, yada, yada. Columbus discovered America. Uh, there's a lot of problems with that. Uh, first off, Columbus was a real person. Uh, it, it's a very popular thing, it seems, these days for conspiracy theorists, uh, and I don't consider myself one, uh, to take some famous person or persons who did something that that we all know about and say, well, that person never really existed. Was some Shakespeare didn't write his own work. Somebody else wrote it. Uh, and, so, and there is actually a, a, a sliver... <laughs> of anti-Columbus thinking that says the guy we all think of as Christopher Columbus wasn't really Christopher Columbus. He was another guy, and but I didn't really get into that. I, I mentioned it, but I didn't really get into it because that's a whole other project. Yeah, but I will actually uh, cut you off quickly to ask you this one question. What, uh, I heard that Columbus was an alias name. Yes. It was, okay. Well, according to this conspiracy theory, <laughs> okay. That the that the you know real guy uh, was a guy named Zarco who was Portuguese working for the Portuguese government who's trying to undermine the Spanish government because they're both fighting to see who gets to control access to Africa and then to India and you know it snowballs into this whole long thing. But Christopher Columbus. Uh, Cristobal Colon, you can say his name a half a dozen different ways, was a real person. We, 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 we know that. Uh, and he did sail with three ships, the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria. Uh, he was bankrolled by the Spanish crown, uh, Ferdinand and Isabella. And he comes across the ocean and he finds what he thinks he's looking for. He's not looking for America. Virtually no one in Europe, uh, really, virtually no one outside of the Americas know that the Americas are there. As far as Europeans are concerned, if you sail west away from Europe, it's just going to be this huge ocean. You're going to come around to the other side of the world, and you're going to wind up in Asia somewhere, China, maybe India. That's where Columbus is going. He's trying to get to India. He's not trying to get to this mythical place uh, that's halfway through because 
this the, the the Colombian travels, and he goes four times. Most people, when they think of Columbus, they think of that one trip. They think of the 1492 trip. But he comes back, and he goes back and back and forth four times. And he's not out for adventure. He's not out to broaden the human experience. You know, he's not out to try to bring all the cosmos under one understanding of where we are. He's out for the money. This is a business venture. Europeans' interest in the Americas right from day one is always about money. They see the Americas or what they think is the Americas, what they think is India. They think it as an opportunity to get rich. That's the reason why Columbus goes on this trip. That's the reason why Ferdinand and Isabella bankroll him. Because they figure if this guy can find a cheap, easy way to India, we can make a fortune off of this because other European countries aren't going to be able to do it. And by the time they get around to it, we can have control of it. So he heads west uh, and he runs into land. He thinks he's in like a series of outer barrier islands off the coast of India. Uh, the reality is he's in the Caribbean what we now call the Caribbean. And he goes back and he says, I made it to India. And But that's the basic idea of who discovered America. Christopher Columbus comes along, he, he finds America and that gets this whole machinery turning uh, where other Europeans are gonna come over and start exploring and start gobbling up land and you know murdering the native people and, you know, uh, um, Growing sugar and tobacco very quickly degenerates into genocide, but we we don't like to talk about that, you know. Um, but uh, so there's that. So that actually did happen. Columbus does does come over 1492. He thinks he's in India. He goes to his deathbed. He's on his deathbed, and people try to tell him, Admiral, you know, you found this whole new place. And he's like, No, I didn't. I found a way to India. Why are you keep <laughs> telling me this nonsense? Were you there? No, you weren't there. I was there. I was in India, you know, and I'm talking to guys. And so how long was that after he he discovered it? Well, he, he shows up in 1492. It isn't really... People don't really realize what they've found or what they've come across uh, until about, oh... About 1500. You know, it's it's still kind of up in the air about what is this place really? Because some other people have come along behind Columbus and they and they get there. Uh, the the first map that famously contains the word America, uh, the, what's called the Van Simuler map. You have to say it with an outrageous German accent, Van Simuler and his partner Matthias Ringman, they're the ones who are trying to create a new cosmography that is a, a a complete book of the universe and as they're working on their uh, ringman was the author von Mueller was the cartographer he's the one that's making the maps and they get this bright idea let's include a map of this new place because the term novus mundus new world that's gotten <laughs> The origins of that term are a little dicey. Uh, it's usually attributed to Amerigo Vespucci. But we could do this whole show just on how America gets its name. Yeah. But, you know, I don't I don't want to I don't want to drift away. You're, yeah, without drifting too, too far. But yeah. I'm going to ask you quickly for people uh, watching us who don't know. Um, you said cosmography. Could right. you quick second to explain what that well, is? Well, cosmography is basically just a book that attempts to include everything we know about the universe writing about the cosmos cosmography uh and they were very popular we don't really make them anymore uh they the, the closest you get to cosmographies today are atlases the modern atlas you know like a book of maps uh usually just maps with very little text they begin as these cosmographies, this attempt to say, here is, you can have in this one book, 
all the knowledge about the universe, all the knowledge about the earth. And so that's that's what von C. Mueller and Ringman are trying to do. And a number of them have made before and since, uh, but they decide to include all this information on this new place. And they include inform they get they get information from Columbus, not directly from him, because he's dead by the time they start doing this. Uh, they throw in information supposedly that comes from Amerigo Vespucci. And Vespucci is a whole other problematic story because he's, he's not really what most people think. But, you know, we'll, we'll sort of skate over that quickly. <laughs> yeah, so this is like a whole map book. And in it, there's also like herbal lore, astronomical lore of the time. Sure. Okay. Yes. Yes. All right. And so, yes. So they decide to, let's make a map of the earth and include this new land over here, west of Europe. Uh, you know, they were professional cartographers. That's what they did for a living. And so they draw it and then they decide, okay, well, we got to name it something. Uh, and they come up with a bright idea. We used mostly information we got from Amerigo Vespucci. So let's call it America. So this book appears with this map in it. And for the very first time, this landmass is labeled America. Uh, now, both Ringman and Vespucci, I'm sorry, Ringman and Von C. Mueller, some years when they go to do a new edition, they sit down and they say, you know, were we right to call this America? Because it's, eh. and so they changed their minds. And so the second edition, the word America doesn't, they use Novus Mundus, New World. Uh, but by then, you know, the cat's out of the bag. Other map makers have copied this. And so now America, the name America sticks to this place and you're never going to get rid of it. So, what I wanted to talk about in this book was who are all these other people that legend, myth, tradition, whatever, says got here before Columbus. Uh, one of the things uh, I, I've always found fascinating about the whole Columbus story is Columbus never actually lands on the mainland of America. He's on the he's on the islands in the Caribbean. Uh, he never comes to what we now call North America. He know, doesn't even know it's there, uh, but somehow uh, he gets credit for all of this. But there are these stories, or there are all these legends about these different people who supposedly came here way before Columbus. Um, and that's what I wanted to talk about in this book. And so I talk about things like St. Brendan and uh, Prince Madoc. Uh, there are stories about Portuguese fishermen who wind up here first, who don't even know where they are. There's a tradition about Chinese explorers coming to what they call Fusang. Uh, that's what supposedly early Chinese explorers called the Americas. Uh, there are legends about a Mali Africa king named Abu Bakri, who also gets over here first. We also have the interesting case of the so-called mound builders. The mound builders were these people, they're Native American people, who built basically cities. You know, we have this myth that somehow Native Americans didn't know anything about building, that all they really built were these sort of simple structures with like twigs and skins on top of them. Uh, but there were Native American cultures who built genuine cities uh, all along the, up and down the Mississippi River Valley and even out, out in the Western territories, uh, cities with streets and, you know, stone buildings. And when Europeans find, come across these, they refuse to think that Native Americans did this. The, the, the Native Americans, the Indians, who we get from Columbus, because Columbus thinks he's in India, 
And so he starts referring to the people there as Indians. That's why Native Americans are sometimes called Indians, because it's all Columbus's fault. <laughs> yeah. And so there, you know, the Europeans, explorers, they find these stone cities and say, well, the Native Americans, the, the Indians are too stupid to have been able to build these. There must have been some great white lost race that came here eons and, ago. And this goes all the way back to the very beginning when people were, when Europeans were first finding these. Yes. Like right from the start. There's no way that the Indians built these. They're too complicated. They're too sophisticated. Two things which the native people are not. And so we got to come up with ideas about who really did all this. Oh my God. So what are, all right. So I'm, I'm curious, like, I don't have a historian's mind at all. I'm just a filmmaker. Um, as a historian, like, wh like, where'd you go? How'd you find these sources? Like, fill me in on that. Well, what we historians do, we look for paperwork. Uh, you know, when a, when historian starts a re when I start a research project, my first question are my my first question is, where's the papers? Where are the letters? Where are the notebooks? Where are the written accounts of all of this? Uh, that's basically your your basic difference between a historian and an archaeologist. Archaeologists look for physical objects. Historians look for the written word. Now historians also look for physical objects, and archaeologists look for the written word too, but the emphasis is a, is a little different. Archaeologists go for objects, uh, and my my many archaeologist friends who are listening to this right now are probably screaming at me. Uh, historians look for texts. And what happens is, when you get a little piece of something, and you start following it, and usually what happens is, as you follow some little trail, it branches out and you start finding more things and you follow this trail and that branches out into a hundred trails that way. And you follow this trail and that branches out into a hundred trails that way. And so very quickly, all this stuff starts coming out uh, that you can, that you can follow. And so that's how it happened. Uh, I knew I, I started with what is sometimes referred to as the Viking theory. That's usually the kind of entry portal for a lot of people who want to look at this. And, and that's because there's a lot of material on it and a lot of material that's easy to find. And you start looking at the Viking theory and then you start seeing references to these other people. And so then you follow those. And then you look at the mythology. For example, you have St. Brendan, who's an Irish monk, and you have Prince Madoc, who's a Welsh prince. There are stories about them in their cultures. Uh, Brendan was a monk. He, he travels around so much that he gets known as Brendan the Navigator. Uh, he is credited with being uh, with discovering the Faroe Islands uh, north of Scotland. Uh, he 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 travels around in little tiny boats, finds a bunch of stuff. And so people think, well, he's here's a guy who has been sailing around. He probably got to America, but there's no evidence he did. Prince Madoc, there's a story about Prince Madoc where he he's Welsh. He comes from an important Welsh family. These stories always have a hero. There's always that one guy, never a woman, it's always a guy usually from like a royal family uh, who, for whatever reason, decides to, you know, hightail it out of there. And the legend says that Madoc, who we think was a real person, came from this wealthy, important Welsh royal family. Uh, but he had a couple of brothers ahead of him. And so he's not going to inherit the kingdom when his dad dies. So he decides to go off on his own and he takes a boat and he takes some friends. A lot of these stories sound like a bunch of drunken frat guys who get in the car on a weekend with like half a dozen, you know, cases of beer in the trunk and they just head off to see what they can find. 
And so that's what Madoc does. He heads off and he finds a place. It's never really identified where he gets to, if he gets to anywhere. Uh, same thing with Brendan. He heads off west, gets to, you know, somewhere. And it's usually later researchers, later writers who come across this material and say, wait a minute. Madoc got in a boat with a bunch of his friends and they head west out over the great western sea and they find a mysterious place well what do you find west of the british isles that seems like a mystery they must have gone to america madoc discovered america now this will come back much later after north america starts to get colonized by europeans you get a lot of people, not exclusively, but you get a lot of people from the British Isles. A lot of English explorers, Irish explorers, Welsh explorers, Scots explorers coming here. They start setting up uh, you know, communities, and they're the ones who kind of start setting up what will eventually become the 13 colonies. And, and so there's a lot of Welsh people who have immigrated, migrated from Wales to what is now being referred to as British North America. Because the British government now decides, well, there's English people over there. We own it. It's ours now. Uh, and what's interesting is one of the one of the people involved in see this whole story, the minute you find one fascinating character. And you, you think, okay, here's this really fascinating character. You realize there's 10 more fascinating characters lined up behind them uh, involved in all of this. And so when the British, part of the reason why the British decide that North America belongs to them now is because this was during the period of Elizabeth. Elizabeth I, the, 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 the Queen of England, Ginger Liz, as they called her, because she had red hair. Uh, and, you know, this is during... Shakespeare is alive, you know, and she has a council, one of many, who is John Dee, who is already a famous philosopher, thinker, alchemist, occultist. He tells Queen Elizabeth that you need to tell everyone that this new world here belongs to you elizabeth you're going to make it it'll help create a british empire it's thought that john d is the first person to use the expression british empire and so the british decide well this all belongs to us now and so that's why you get a bunch of uh people from the british isles again not exclusively there are people coming from other places but a lot of them are coming from the british isles during this period and so you get uh, the city of Baltimore has been founded, and you got a lot of Welsh people living, congregating in Baltimore. Now, at the same time, there is this kind of revival of Welsh nationalism. And a lot of people want to, you know, we're the Welsh, you know, hooray for the Welsh. And there's this young guy back in Wales named John Thomas Evans. He wants to be a poet. He wants to be an explorer. He loves being Welsh. He wants to promote Welshness. He decides because there is a tradition. Because none of these stories have one version. They all have like a dozen versions to them. And one of the Madoc versions is that Madoc gets to North America and he and his merry band of, of Welsh pranksters head inland and they encounter a number of native american groups and before anybody knows it the welsh are breeding interbreeding with the native americans and so as the story goes this whole new population of half european half welsh half native americans is now running around North America. 
And because they've the, the native people have bred with the Welsh, supposedly, you get these groups of native people who have very light skin, uh, blue eyes, blonde, even red hair. And so this becomes a thing that people think is real. The so-called Welsh Indians, sometimes called white Indians. A lot of people get interested in this. And one of them is this guy, John Thomas Evans. He's like in his mid-20s at the time. And he decides he's going to go and prove, number one, that Madoc discovered America, and two, that Welsh Indians slash white Indians is a real thing. And so he gets on a boat, comes over, winds up in Baltimore. Now, this whole story, this whole story about who discovered America is filled with tragic characters. That's one of the reasons why I was kind of attracted to it. I'm attracted to tragic characters. You know, people who try to find something, even though everyone is telling them it's not there, you're not going to be good enough. John Thomas Evans has no experience at anything. He's not an explorer. He can't read a map. Uh, he knows nothing about conditions here in America. But he is so determined, he just gets on a boat and comes over and figures, well, I'll figure something out when I get there. So he gets into Baltimore and he, he gets hooked up with the Welsh community there. And he tells them what he's trying to do. And they're all like, dude, don't do this. This is a suicide mission. You know, first off, we've never seen any Welsh Indians. And secondly, you don't know anything about the interior. I Indians aren't one people. There are a lot of different ethnic groups who all speak different languages. You don't know any of those languages. You, 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 stay with us. Settle here with us in the Welsh community, and we'll all live happily ever after. He, no, I don't want... He gets to the Mississippi River, and he hooks up with some sort of shady characters, and he gets on a boat, and they travel north up the Mississippi River. He's in the middle of nowhere. You know? He's this pudgy 20-something white guy from Wales, stumbling around, trying to prove that white Indians exist. Uh, and he has a number of adventures, and he finally encounters the Mandan people. And the Mandan uh, live in Nebraska, the Dakotas, and they're a group that their name will often come up when speaking about these oh, European Native Americans, you know, people, Europeans who made it with Native Americans and created this sort of new group of people. And he meets the, the Mandan, and they're really nice. They're one of the few groups that treat him nicely. You know, they don't beat him up. They don't, you know, they don't try to kill him. They kind of welcome him in. I'm sure the, the, the reason they didn't, you know, they treated him sort of nice. It was like they were thinking, who's this insane white guy? You know, we see hardly any white guys out here. And finally one comes along and he's a nut job. Uh, and, you know, he's looking for something that's not there. And so uh, I think what happened is they sort of pat him on the head and say, oh, yeah, yeah, we've heard about uh, we have people around here who, who who look like you. Meanwhile, there's nobody out there that looks like him. And it starts to dawn on him that this whole white Indian uh, Madoc, story, Madoc story is nonsense. It never happened. It's just a myth. He's kind of heartbroken because he's come halfway around the world to try to prove this thing. And then when he gets there, there's no Santa Claus, you know? <laughs> and so, you know, he's, he's, he's really bummed out. He heads back down the Mississippi, he winds up in St. Louis, where he sort of becomes an alcoholic. And then he, you know, all he wants to do is go back to Wales, but he never does because he catches malaria and he, you know, he dies in a, in a, in a run down, disgusting hovel somewhere on some back street in, in St. Louis. Uh, and so I always, I always see him as like, of all these tragic characters, he's the most tragic in part because he's one of the few, one of these people who try to prove this thing 
and reaches a point where he says, you know, I was wrong. Everything I thought about this, everything I thought about Madoc was wrong. Uh, and very few of these, the, the, I call them the outsider thinkers, outsider writers. Very few of them ever reach that kind of emotional, intellectual point, which is tough, you know, for anybody. When you believe in something all your life, you know, and suddenly you get hit in the face with evidence that this thing you thought you believed in, you thought was real, that you may have based your whole life upon, you suddenly realize it's not there. It's false. You were wrong the whole time. Uh, and people don't deal with that kind of thing, you know. It's like finding out when you're in your 40s that your parents weren't your really your real parents, you know, that you were adopted or something. Um, and so they never, they never, he never proves that there were white Indians, never proves that there were, that there were uh, Welsh Indians. Uh, and to this day, you'll still find people who will bring, oh, well, there are, there are Indians out in the West who look like white people. That's because Madoc and, you know, so there's that legend gone. Uh, there's a bunch of others we could we could spend the entire time just on one of these, uh, you know the 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 China, the Asia theory, uh, it, it is fascinating uh, because it there are Chinese texts. There's this very famous Chinese manuscript called the Classics of Mountain and Sea, uh, which is kind of a Chinese version of a cosmology trying to tell the whole story of the world. And in that and a few other texts, it mentions something called Fusang. Uh, we, we spell it in the Latin alphabet, F-U-S-A-N-G. And there are some maps that were discovered in the 20th century, uh, maps drawn in China, dra maps drawn in Korea, uh, that show sort of the world, sort of world maps, sort of crudely drawn. Uh, but there are these sort of land masses that are labeled Fusang, kind of west of the eastern coast of China. And some people think that that means America. And in these sort of crudely drawn maps, Fusang is America. Uh, there are a couple of Explorers' names, um, Zheng He, um, Wei Shen, who are in the tradition that they somehow make it to Fusang. Uh, Zheng He was a real person, he was an admiral in the Chinese Navy, very close to the emperor, who did do a lot of exploring with, with navies of many large ships. Uh, we know they traveled down into Malaysia uh, and towards like Singapore and Burma and those places. Uh, and so people think, well, if he did that, he must have gone to America too. And But there's no evidence of that. Uh, Wei Shen uh, actually comes along about a thousand years before Zheng He. His story is he's a monk. And again, it's the bunch of frat boys in a car on the weekend. Wei Shen gets a bunch of his monk friends. They get in a boat and they head east out across the, the ocean. And he supposedly gets to America, uh, which he may also have called Fusang, but we're not really sure. And he gets to around the year 500. He gets to what we now know as Mexico. And Wei Shen encounters the native people of Mexico and realizes they're not very smart. They don't know how to do anything. He teaches them. Wei Shen teaches the people of ancient Mexico, the Mesoamericans. We don't call them pre-Columbians anymore. He teaches them farming. He teaches them the arts. He teaches them the metallurgy. So there's one guy creates the Aztecs and the Incas and the Maya and the Olmecs and basically every major 
Central American culture is a result, excuse me, of this one Chinese guy and, and a couple of his friends uh, showing up and teaching them how to be civilized. Uh, you see that the, that's one of the, another one of those threads which we could spend the whole time talking about in the whole who discovered America question. There's a lot of racial baggage. Uh, there's a lot of supremacist baggage. There's a lot of anger and hateful baggage in this. Some legends less, some legends more, but there is this sort of universal belief by all these groups and all these legends that the Native people are basically too stupid to have done anything on their own. They needed these outsiders to come along and teach them how to do this stuff. Now, as you can imagine, this sort of thing drives Native American historians crazy. Uh, there's, a, there's a group of Central American historians, very good historians, very good archaeologists, who have spent large chunks of their careers trying to explain that this is all racial garbage.